Good morning, Grace Church. Why don't you guys stand with us? We are going to spend the next several minutes just worshiping the name of the Lord and lifting Him high. stand against your mind there is no shadow that has ever overcome your life you've always been with us every battle you've already won we've already won
Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand Everything around me shaking oh, I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't He won't I've still got joy
faithfulness you have shown yourself strong to be the God who is faithful to us Lord no matter the circumstance or the storm that we find ourselves in God we love you for that thank you Jesus oh we bless you amen and amen hey let's give the choir and the team a hand this morning Welcome to Grace Church. We're glad that you're here. Do me a favor. Turn around and give somebody a high five. Give them a nice compliment. Tell them how sharp they look up in the balcony as well. If you're online, we'd love to hear where you're watching from this morning. Put it down there in the chat. Let us hear from you. If you will, go ahead and, and pull out your bulletin that you should have received on your way in this morning if you have that just going to highlight a, a few things here this morning before we do that if you're newer around here welcome you're always welcome to come and be part of our, our weekend services we have classes and groups events community building activities all kinds of things happening throughout the week make sure you check out our website or the bulletin lots of things that are happening and if you are new there's a connect card right here in front of you and up in the, uh, the balcony as well it's an easy way to ask some questions about who we are as a church, what we believe, how you can fit in. Maybe you got questions about who Jesus is, anything like that. We'd love to interact with you. Or maybe you have a prayer request, you could put that on there as well. And then when you're leaving this morning as you exit, you can put it at any of the offering boxes around the exits. You can hit the information booth, however you'd like to do that. And of course, uh, our ways of giving, we do that at the end of the service on your way out as, as well as you can see there. Okay, a couple of real important things. This first one, open this up for me. Look at that top left box there. We call this event Sunrite. It's a weekend that we have once a year. In August, we do it every year. And we're targeting dads and grandpas and our sons or our grandsons, the ages of 12 to 17. Now, this is a weekend. We leave on a Friday. We get back on a Sunday. And I'm telling you, this is a life-changing experience, not only for our sons, but also for us as dads. And I, this is where wives right now, you look at the schedule and you say, I don't know what you're doing, but you're going to move it around because you're going to do this. Our sons will, will thank you. Dads will thank you. This is a, a weekend that you don't want to miss. I say it over and over again. Owen and I, my, my now 14-year-old, we've been doing it for the last two years. It is an incredible weekend. We're going to have some of our leaders right outside the auditorium there in that corner booth on your way out. Just if you have any questions. You can see some details here as well. Real important meeting tomorrow night. If you can make it, be a part of that. You don't want to miss it. And then if you'll just look at the bottom, again, Sunday school. We're on our third month now that we've shifted our service times here on Sunday morning. We started Sunday school. Every month we're doing a different topic. So we just had a whole new slot of classes that we started this morning we're doing conflict resolution in relationships. How do we get through conflict? Anybody ever had conflict in a relationship, by the way? Oh, just a handful of us, okay. There's actual real tools that the Bible teaches to help us navigate through that conflict. And then Brandon is doing an overview of the Old Testament as well and how to make sense of the Old Testament. These are classes. Get here a little bit early on Sundays at 9 before you come into church. You will, you'll thank me for it. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the freedom to assemble here in church, to praise your name. Lord, we just, we don't take it for granted. And Lord, we thank you for your provision in our life. Even in hard times, you provide, and we thank you for it. We love you, and we ask you for the name of Jesus, Lord, to increase in fame all over the St. Louis region. It's in his name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 Walking while people are praying is all right, right? <laughs> I, walk, I, I cannot sit down when I'm praying. I can't concentrate when I'm praying, so I am a 
You're kind of a walk and pace guy. Yeah, boy, I am a pacer for sure. Well, a little bit of watch and pray, all right? For those of you who are joining us, those were Jesus' words. He told us, when you see stuff happening, keep your eyes open. Since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade on June 24th, we've watched just a whole lot of anger and hatred explode on the left. I think the big fear right now is that, you know, they're gonna make same-sex marriage illegal. And so they even caught a guy who planned to assassinate three of the Supreme Court justices to prevent any future reversals. Then on July 18th, Vice News ran a story that headlined Christian nationalism drove these people out of their churches. Somebody sends me this thing. That wasn't on my radar. I mean, uh, that, that was a new idea. And their, they, this, their intro really got my attention. Pastor Ron Tucker took the stage one weekend in early July and railed about Antifa, Black Lives Matter, critical race theory, feminism, gun laws, abortion, protesters disrupting Supreme Court breast, uh, Justice Brett Kavanaugh's dinner at a DC steakhouse and promoted the baseless claim that the Capitol riot was a hoax. I thought, so, so I'm thinking. <laughs> so, so the headline didn't get your attention, but that, but that opening line Oh, the did. opening line got my attention. And I'm thinking, there's no way I said all that in one weekend. Last night we had people shout, yes, you did, yes, you did. <laughs> yeah, I actually did, and there was more. <laughs> uh, so the, the article went on. Uh, now, instead of talking about compassion and loving your neighbor, Tucker is preparing his flock for a bloody final battle where the bullets are real. The article wasn't flattering, there was misinformation, but here's what they were really going after. And I, you know, we, we weren't as attuned to this as we needed to be. This is what, this, uh, the, the, uh, this story, this, this is them again, this story is not unique to Grace Church. Christians from around the country said they witnessed their congregations lose float focus and slide into Christian nationalism. There it is. That's the name, the moniker that they've given us. And here's their definition. Christian nationalists believe that America is an inherently Christian nation and that the nation's laws should reflect evangelical values. This, <laughs> I know, wait, wait, wait. This is them, all right? This belief system directly undermines the founding philosophy of the United States, the separation of church and state. So they're, they're saying, this is what they're saying, just to get it clear, that, the, uh, that that's our founding philosophy in our founding documents. That's completely, it's in none of our founding documents. I mean, that is complete disinformation. It's taken from a letter Thomas Jefferson wrote to a Baptist church in Danbury, Connecticut, reassuring them that our Bill of Rights keeps the state out of the church, not the church out of the state. The article continued, all right? It, it, it also results in a murky moral framework where right-wing culture war issues, whether it's Hunter Biden's laptop, drag queen story hours, or the result of 2020 election take on biblical significance. Now, I'm just gonna keep saying this, guys. There are a boatload of cultural issues right now that we should absolutely be viewing through the lens of scripture, which is why every week we're up here reminding you why we're addressing this stuff. Jesus called us to be the salt and the light. He called the church his ecclesia, the governing body. And he told us to watch and pray when we see the culture being taken over like it is right now. Wes, that wasn't all. I mean, they said more. I mean, this is um, not just them, but other. Yeah, I this. want to read this because about the same time, it, listen to this. So this is all in July. And I, I like how you connected it even to the Roe v. Wade w uh, ruling, possibly. So when Vice News ran this story, here's another one from CNN on July 24th. An imposter Christianity, quote unquote, is threatening American democracy. Time Magazine, July 28th, faith is powerful. That's why Christian nationalism is so dangerous. And at the same time, Christian nationalism was trending on Twitter. And you know what's interesting is you were, I, was, I wasn't in this loop, but you were aware of this because you had friends that were talking about this stuff, what, a year or two ago? Right, and they would use, you know, we didn't really ever have the term defined on what it was. It was basically used as a, don't be a Christian nationalist, which nobody really understood what that meant. But it was a, a fear-mongering way to kind of say, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane, right. 
I, I think this is a direct re reaction to Roe v. Wade being overturned and the need right now for a more visible, available enemy than just those you know, five Supreme Court justices. The gas on the fire is this accusation, which also comes from Vice News piece, Christian nationalism often overlaps with and provides cover for white supremacy and racial subjugation. That's, that's what that's they said. That's why you don't want to be titled a Christian nationalist. Right, that's right. The... Here, they, here they go. They're, they're tying it together. By the way, this is not going to shut me up. I mean, this, threats, threats like this, and this is what you've got to figure out too. Threats like this are control devices. This is all about intimidation. This is all about bullying. It's an attempt to silence, closet, and bury us, and we're not going to cower. We, we're not going to cower. Wes, you're going to something this week. Yeah, this week, Amanda and I are flying out on Wednesday. There's an event in San Diego. Charlie Kirk and Turning Point USA are, are putting it on. And I'm encouraged because it's not just, you know, I'm encouraged by Ron and saying, we're not going to stop. We're going to bury him. We've got a whole church here that you all are, are with us in this. But there are churches all over the nation. There's over 300 pastors that are gathering in San Diego that are basically you know, committing to do this together. So there this are churches cool, waking cool. up and getting bold all over the place. Yeah. So, we got to, yeah, we'll talk about that next weekend because I, you're going to come back loaded. <laughs> I just know it. <laughs> this is going to, gosh, I can't imagine. The well, list of Bill speakers. Bill Fetter, David Barton, gosh. Jack Hibbs, Rob McCoy, all oh, these guys, Sean Foy. Everybody who's in this, you know, together. Oz Guinness, his book, uh, this is a book I read a long time ago, uh, talks about the golden triangle of freedom in his book, The Last Call for Liberty. He said, the framers of our Constitution recognized that in order for us to be a self-governing people, three pillars have to be in place. They're like the three legs of a three-legged stool. You take one away, any one of those things, and America will fall. Our democratic experiment will not work without these three things. Here they are, virtue, faith, and freedom. The only way a people can govern themselves, that's what's unique about us, we are self-governing, is to have an inviolable standard of virtue that their leaders are held accountable to, and that standard has to be based on a solid faith in nature's God, the God of the Bible. And for the record, this nation was birthed out of spiritual revival. And that faith can't be forced. It has to be the will of the people which requires freedom. You take away any one of those pillars and the nation falls apart. And you don't need a degree in social science right now to see all three of those things are in jeopardy. We have, we have to have Christian nationalism to be self-governing is the bottom line. I mean, what's happening in America has never worked in the history of man. The, 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 this nation is the shining light. Our exceptionalism is because of our belief in God. You know, we don't, we don't have many options. I mean, th there aren't many options uh, that'll work. We're either gonna have Sharia law, a monarchy, a dictatorship, or this unique system of checks and balances our founders set up called a republic. And we have to keep it as we the people. We the people have to keep it. That's what Benjamin Franklin told us. You know, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about this this week. Nobody, we're, our young people are not going to go to war to protect the mess that we see devolving right now called America. This, this is the oath that I swore when I joined the army many, many years ago. I, Ron Tucker, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to the regulation of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, so help me God. I mean, that <laughs> sure sounds like Christian nationalism to me. The three pillars of the golden triangle of freedom are the only foundation for a self-governing society like ours. Our founders understood that, guys. It's why we desperately need revival right now. It's why we're praying desperate prayers. God, revive the church, awaken your church. And that's hopeful, 300 pastors, that's, that's hopeful. All right, here's just one of the things, I'm not going into 20 today, <laughs> one of the things that's undermining our freedom right now, it's the way this pandemic was planned out and managed. I've read so many books on this. I've read 
two probably in the last two weeks just on this. Listen to so many doctors describe the way we were lied to, we were forced to take an untested vaccine that really wasn't a vaccine, it's no longer working, is actually doing us harm, how many other drugs to treat this disease were taken off the market, you were censored if you even mentioned it by name, and we know because two of our weekends got taken down because I mentioned the name. And, uh, and I'm saying this because right now we've gotta go into resistance mode. I mean, we've gotta say no more lockdowns, mandates, vaccines for babies, little children. We got a, va we got a video uh, one of our team found about vaccinating kids on our resource page. Please watch this, please watch it. And, and, and you can fast forward to where the interview begins. It's Joni Lamb talking to two renowned uh, doctors about this. Uh, the, and unless you think I'm overreacting about this, the Biden administration declared monkeypox a public health emergency as, as the US outbreak grew to 6,600 cases, 98% of them are men who have sex with men. Think back to our last public health emergency. They forced people to die alone, separated from their families to quote, slow the spread of COVID. But for monkeypox, San Francisco will still hold their kink festival despite declaring a state of emergency. Any suggestion to abstain from sex for two weeks to slow the spread will get you banned from social media. So moms taking their kids to the park during COVID were called murderers and orgies with strangers during monkeypox are not to be criticized. This is lunacy. I mean, this is absolute lunacy. All right, so here's the thing. We gotta be careful with each other. We gotta guard our hearts from getting offended, because this is the big deal. I mean, we're seeing this here. We gotta stay tender toward one another, respect each other's choices. You know, like not lecturing each other, you know, on wearing masks or not wearing masks, because we've had some of that. So, you know, we gotta chill. We can't get caught in this stuff. And there are a couple wins to celebrate here. I mean, we've had some- There is some good news. Good it's not news. just, you know, the, sometimes we feel like we're, it's just We're only being doom and gloom, but no, the Lord is hearing us, and there's pushback, and there's, let's just read it. Here we go. Yeah. The Air Force, this is just this past uh, recently here, the Air Force has ceased discharges of unvaccinated airmen after a federal judge. <laughs> this is affecting even some of our families. I mean, we had many yeah, families, that had here. military families that were very burdened by this. And so they uh, halted the discharge of, of members who have religious exemptions to COVID vaccination, marking a huge win for thousands of members of the Air Force. This week, Christian Ministry Liberty Council settled a class action lawsuit for $10.3 million on behalf of more than 500 current or former healthcare employees. A Illinois hospital system had denied them religious exemption for its COVID vaccine mandate and had to settle with $10.3 million payout. Yay, God. We got a huge win. Here, here's the problem, all right, I know I'm rattling some of you, but it's because I'm exposing the fact that we can no longer blindly trust our government. I know, I know, it rattled me. That was the thing I, I had the most trouble wrapping my, heart, uh, wrapping my head around. And that's why this is so hard to heal, hear. But the corruption that has gotten in almost every level of our bureaucracy is staggering. And if we don't face it, confront it, and hold our leaders accountable, we're done. We gotta get back to virtue, faith, and freedom, or this experiment is over. And that's why we're praying for, you know, uh, for revival, and we're committed to civic engagement. Man, you guys. That's right, and just on that note, civic engagement, we've had lots of great things happening. This Thursday in the Foundry, there's details in your bulletin for those that have already been involved or maybe you're saying, I wanna get more involved. That's a meeting you don't wanna miss. Uh, I mean, you killed it on this last, this election this week. I mean, I actually walked into the voting booth and knew who to vote for, which is, you know, instead of looking at all well, that. Part of our civic engagement team is helping to educate our people well, yeah, on all the giving things us and candidates, clarity et Clarity on what these guys not just say, but what they vote for. Yeah. So that's, that's it. All right, pray Let's for Let's stand and just come before the Lord before we, I told Ron, I think last night we're on session 552 in the Book of Romans. 
So we're getting ready to get into it. I love it, verse by verse. Father, here we are, we come before you, and God, we thank you for the grace of God upon all of us, yes. because it's no mistake that all of us are here for such a time as this. Lord, you give grace to not be Trust afraid. You, you give grace to be godly. You, you give grace, Lord, for our hearts to be strong and our minds to be clear. Yes. I ask you, Lord, to bless us and open the scriptures to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. All right, you can be seated. <sighs> Take a deep breath. <laughs> you, see, you know, it takes me about five minutes, Ron, after you do this to settle down. So, all right, Lord, help us settle down. Uh, I'm in deep weeds today. I'm just gonna admit it when I'm to, from the start, this is a subject I have never taught on purposely. <laughs> but it's in the Bible, it's in front of us, and there's no way to avoid what Paul's talking about. It's this whole subject of election, all right? So, in our last session of Romans, we talked about the long history of anti Semitism that has followed the Jews wherever they've gone. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, but that weekend, a topic, a trending topic on Twitter was about. Anne Frank having white privilege. <laughs> I mean, this is a 13-year-old girl forced into hiding because the Nazis were hunting down the Jews and her family hid them. I mean, she died in a concentration camp at 15. I mean, how does that equal white privilege? I mean, that's how crazy this has gotten. Every Christian should read Dr. Brown's book, Our Hands Are Stained With Blood, because uh, man, I'm telling you, that will help you understand why so many Jews hate the church. If you missed that weekend, we got it posted on our website. We looked at Paul's list of the advantages to being a Jew in Romans 9. First he says, uh, verse two, my, my heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. God called them Israelites, which means princes of God, chosen to be his adopted children, God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them and gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors, and Christ himself was an Israelite as far as human, his human nature is concerned. And he is God, the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. So in light of those incredible advantages, Paul asked the question in Romans 6, well then, has God failed to fulfill his promise to Israel? No, not at all, because not all those who are born into the nation of Israel are truly members of God's people. The New King James says they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Paul's in anguish that in spite of all God's done for them, Israel has rejected his Messiah. Then he makes one of the most profound statements in the Bible, saying they're not all Israel who are descended from Israel. With all those lavish privileges, why have they failed to believe in the one who, foretold, who was foretold by their prophets? Has God failed to keep his promises? Because that's the real question. If these are unconditional covenants from God, then how is it they're no longer God's people? That's a massive theological problem. Has God failed to do what he said he would do? His answer is verse seven. Being descendants of Abraham doesn't make them truly Abraham's children, for the scriptures say, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. And he argues his case by comparing three uh, pairs of men. Case history number one is Isaac, verse eight. This means that Abraham's physical descendants are not necessarily children of God. Only the children of the promise are considered to be Abraham's children. When he's 86, God promises Abraham a son through whom all the promises and covenants are gonna be fulfilled. <clears throat> At this point, he's childless, and when he tells his wife, Sari, she's not on board. <laughs> she's definitely not on board. She says, you know, God must mean we're supposed to follow the custom of her day and have a son by my servant, Hagar. So instead of following God, Abraham follows his wife and had Ishmael with her servant. The boy's 100% Abraham's son, but God says this was not the plan, and I don't change. So a few years pass, Abraham's 99, Ishmael's 13. Genesis 17, 15 says, God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, her name will be Sarah, which means princess. 
He says, I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. That's number two. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings and a people will come from her. Abraham fell face down. And it's not because he's awestruck. I mean, this spiritual faith giant laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man who's 100 years old? I mean, will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? I mean, Lord, you gotta be kidding me. If only Ishmael might live under your blessing, God. That's, his, that's what he says. Abraham loves this kid. He wants God to fulfill his promises with, with Ishmael. Then God said, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will name him Isaac. I'll establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I've heard you, I'll bless him. I'll make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He'll be a father of 12 rulers and I'll make him into a great nation. You probably know this, that Ishmael is the father of the Arab nations. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. So he gives him the due date and says, this time next year, a boy is going to be born to your barren wife, which punctuates the fact that Israel is the product of a miracle. Paul wants us to see that God made a clear choice here. Even though Ishmael was the firstborn, he wasn't in the line of promise. The covenants weren't made to him and his children. And by the way, after Sarah died, Abraham took another wife named Keturah and had six more sons. I mean, God, whatever he did to that dude. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's better than Viagra, whatever it was, I'm telling you. <laughs> but when Abraham died, he left all that he had to Isaac. I'm sorry I said that. You know, when I say things like that, <laughs> your kids say, Mom, what is Viagra? Yeah, sorry. Sorry I did it. It was not in my notes, all right? I shouldn't have. <laughs> so, so when he dies, he leaves all that he has to Isaac. He gave gifts to his other son, but his inheritance went to Isaac because he was the miracle child of promise. That's what we're getting at. God even named him Isaac, which means laughter. <laughs> Every time they called him, they were reminded. They both laughed at God's promise in unbelief. But later, in joy. Isaac was their child of faith, and that's the point. The true Israelite is not just a child of the flesh, he's also a child of faith. Well, by the time Jesus came along, I mean, these guys had so lost track of the whole thing that they thought to simply just be born of the limit lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was enough to get you into the eternal kingdom. And that's why when the Pharisees, went, who the Jewish leaders, went to John the Baptist, he refused to baptize him in Matthew 2. Uh, 3, 9, John says, do you think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father? I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children to Abraham. Just being related physically is not enough. That's why when Nicodemus, one of their, I mean, one of the holy guys, one of the leading teachers of Israel, came to Jesus to talk about the kingdom of God, Jesus said this in John 3, 3. He said, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're what? Born again. That really confused this dude. I mean, he's, he's so, so Jesus says it's stronger. In verse five, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Now, Nicodemus is a very religious Jew, but he can't get it. He says, how can these things be? And Jesus answers, verse six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's saying, this is the way it's always been, Nicodemus. A physical descendant of Abraham can only see the kingdom of God by exercising the faith of Abraham. Spiritual Israel never included all the physical des descendants, all physical Israel. So with case history number one, God clearly chooses Isaac over Ishmael to be Abraham's promised heir. It's election. That's what uh, theologians call it. It's God's sovereign choosing. All right, Jacob is case history number two. Romans 9, 10. Sarah's son was our ancestor Isaac. When he married Rebekah, she gave birth to twins, but before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad, she received a message from God showing us clearly here that God chooses people according to his own purposes, not according to their good and bad behavior. She was told, your older son will serve your younger son, 
And you have to know, man, this is completely reverse, you know, of everything in their culture. I mean, this is, what in the world, Lord, are you even doing? This is going to, you know, mess everything up. The firstborn always got everything. But before these boys are born, God told Rebekah, the older will serve the younger. That's one of the strangest accounts in Scripture, Genesis 25. Uh, it says, when Isaac was 40 years old, he married Rebecca. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she, she was unable to have children. So again, God's doing the same thing with them that he did with Abraham. You know, he's getting them to exercise faith because they can't have children. And the Lord answered Isaac's prayer and Rebecca became pregnant with twins. But the two children struggled with each other in her womb. So she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this, why is this happening to me? Why are these kids, you know, not just doing cartwheels, it's more like a kickboxing cage fight inside me. What's going on? Why is there a war happening within me? These two couldn't get along before they were born. God says in verse 23, years, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One will be stronger than the other, and, the, and your younger son will serve your, your older son will serve your younger son. I got that wrong. Again, the older always got it all. I mean, this was, you didn't do this in, that, in those days. The younger son always served the older, but God says, no, I determine who serves whom. So God chose Jacob over Esau, blows up conventional wisdom by giving him the inheritance. God just loves to do this kind of stuff. He loves to use people nobody would have picked to change the world. And Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 1. He says, remember that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. Read this with me. Let's read this, the rest of this. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and use them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. Just because a guy is a great, you know, great in the secular world doesn't mean he'll be great in God's kingdom. And just because he's a nobody or a loser doesn't mean he won't excel and do amazing things for God. God loves to work through our weakness, which is why he picks the strangest characters to serve him. Back here to you know, Isaac Swin, Genesis 25 says, the, the first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat. I don't think I've ever seen that. <laughs> so they named him Esau, which means red. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel. Don't think I've ever heard of that either. So they named him Jacob, which in Hebrew means heel catcher. It actually, it, it actually means deceiver, chiseler, conniver, How'd you like to name your kid that? And he definitely lived up to his name. I mean, Red, on the other hand, is a good old boy. Everybody liked him. And we're told that while Isaac loved Esau, Rebecca loved Jacob in verse 28. Verse 27, as the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful, skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman, but Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. Esau is a warrior. Jacob would have made a good panhandler. I mean, he was... <laughs> he, his wiring was just all messed up. Verse 29, one day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness exhausted and hungry. Esau said, Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. Jacob replied, all right, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Esau said, I'm dying of starvation. What good is my birthright to me now? This guy, you know, lived for the moment. Even though he knew the right of the firstborn, including being the spiritual father of Abraham and Isaac's descendants, he's willing to throw it all away for a pot of stew. Verse 33, Jacob said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. Now that little incident seems insignificant, but, but it was very important from God's point of view. Of all the encounters between these two boys, this is the one God singles out for us to read. 
because it reveals Esau as an unbeliever and Jacob as a conniving believer. <laughs> and yet God chooses him in that condition. I mean, in that condition. I, that's what's staggering. Verse 11, again. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to Rebekah, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hate it. God's saying that hundreds of years later, looking back at their descendants, because all of Esau's lineage, except for just a handful, continued to be unbelievers, but great many of Jacob's believed. So the question Paul's addressing here has got to be the toughest, deepest theological question of all. Maybe more difficult than understanding the Trinity. Why is it that one person believes and another doesn't? Is it some innate goodness or inherent evil? And the simple answer from Paul is no. I mean, we've already studied it in Romans 3.11. He says, no one seeks for God. Well, here in Romans 9, Paul addresses it head on, and he quotes something God said around 400 B.C., Malachi 1. He said, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is, is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Eden, and that's Esau, says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may rebuild, but I'll tear down. And they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord was angry forever. Yikes. I mean, Esau and Jacob were born 1,500 years before that. So this statement in Malachi is God looking back to a choice that he made. And it wasn't because he loved Jacob more. This is, there's no emotion attached to this. God simply made a sovereign choice, not based on human goodness, or anything these two kids did or didn't do, they weren't even born. But God chose Jacob and rejected Esau. And then he confirmed his choice by loving Jacob and his descendants and hating Je Esau's descendants. And he's not talking about individuals. God made a choice and set his love on the objects of his choosing. Back to Romans 9. You notice I'm not commenting on any of this yet. Because <laughs> this is heavy duty, isn't it? Romans 9, 14, Paul says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. So, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Now let's get personal here for a minute. If you have been born again, I want you to think back on your life. Why did you believe? I was raised, you know, in a southern kind of Pentecostal church, hellfire and brimstone, you know, a lot of that was preached from the pulpit. I was, my number one motivation in life was to stay out of hell. I towed the line, man, out of fear. But God didn't size me up and say, you know, Ron is such a good boy, I'm gonna give this kid a ticket to heaven. Because I was born a rebel just like everybody else. And as I grew up, I resented God for robbing me of all the fun of sin. I grew up a miserable religious rule keeper. And maybe you weren't as inhibited. Maybe you might have you know, run to drugs and sex, didn't give God a second thought. And if a parent or friend tried to talk to you about Jesus, you didn't wanna hear it. But then God seemed to just strip away all the fun until you couldn't enjoy anything. Now out of nowhere, for no apparent reason, there was an overwhelming sense of emptiness where God uniquely drove you to seek him. Maybe somebody, you know, God had somebody just, you know, with you on their radar and they just kept talking to you about Jesus. You and I didn't end up believing in God because of something good in us. The Holy Spirit drove us to believe in him because of who God is. So what about all the people that we know who never believed? The people who die without God. How do we resolve God's election or divine choosing with the concept of justice? Is God unfair? That's the question Paul's addressing here in Romans 9. Has God's word failed the Israelite? All right, let's take a breath, step back for a minute, try to get God's perspective on this. At the beginning of time in the Garden of Eden, 
God created the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, and he provided everything for them. They, they lived in an absolute paradise, perfect harmony with God in a world full of love and joy and peace and comfort. They didn't have a gnarly sin nature to fight, so nothing in them wanted to rebel. But for love to work, for love to really be a, a working thing, it has to be reciprocal. And it's why God gave them a test to see if they really wanted to remain in the relationship with him. They couldn't eat the fruit of one tree in the garden. God gave them every reason to stay in the relationship, but Satan came along and convinced them that God was holding out on them, that they couldn't trust his character. He told them God didn't want them to eat of the fruit of that, that one tree because then they would know good and evil and they'd be just like it. They were already just like it. They were created in his image, but they believed the lie and rebelled. God said, the day you eat of the tree, you will surely die. Well, they didn't die physically, but the spiritual part of them that could know God and understand his word died instantly. Their souls were still alive, and in each soul of their progeny was sown this seed of rebellion that became our sin nature. It's the law of biogenesis. All their children and children's children were exactly like them. You and I are just like our original parents. We're born spiritually dead, physically alive with a nature that's in rebellion to God, and that is a very simple thing to prove. Do you parents have to teach your kids to be bad? <laughs> it's a shock, isn't it? Your little two-year-old looks at you and goes, no. You think, oh my goodness. Where did that come from? Had to be his dad. <laughs> no, no. It's in all of us. You have to teach them to be good. Being rebellious comes naturally. And God was under no obligation to do anything about it. I mean, it's a condition Adam and Eve freely chose. He'd done everything he could to keep them from making the choice. So he had no moral obligation or responsibility to do anything to fix this. But because of God, God's nature, his great love, he sovereignly chose to come after us. As a human being, Jesus died for the sins of every person who had ever been born from Adam and Eve. People are saved before the cross because God put their sins on Jesus' account till he would finally pay for them. That's what Paul tells us. And we're only saved today because that sin barrier was removed 2,000 years ago. He nailed our sins to Jesus' cross. Jesus was the only sinless man he took our place. He bore the judgment of a holy God for our sin. God sovereignly chooses to do that. And so do we. We, we choose sovereignly. Our will is fr free to choose. But because we're spiritually dead and we can't really know God and we got a rebellious sin nature, every person freely chooses to reject God <laughs> across the board. It's only after he chases us down that we finally accept him. Well, why do some people, you know, accept it? Because God sovereignly chooses to make some people accept it. The dilemma is, why doesn't he make everybody accept it? I don't know. You didn't expect to hear that, did you? Got no idea. I don't know. But you want to know the, the bigger question? Why does he make anybody accept it? They can't even say, I think God chose some people because you know, he saw this spark of faith in them because that'd make them special. I, I, you know, I can't say God knew I'd believe. Paul, I mean, Paul closes the loop completely. Look at Romans 9, 16 again. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. In God's eyes, none of us deserves to be saved. None of us choose God. He broke down our rebellion drew us to believe. In his great mercy, he chose us. Does that mean he hates those who, who don't choose him? No, Paul's anticipating all our feelings and our objections, explaining why there was always an, an election of God. The twins are the classic example. Case one, Isaac and Ishmael. Case two, uh, Jacob and Esau. Now, case three, in case three, Paul gives us the historical per perspective of Moses and Pharaoh. Because an Israelite could look at Case histories one and two and say, well, God's choice of the second born isn't fair. But God says, yeah, well, it goes further than that. It was his choice that saved you out of Egypt and caused him to judge Pharaoh. Moses, 
And this Pharaoh, if you remember, grew up in the same court. But as the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, Moses is the heir apparent. So you can bet, man, there is competition between these two that is fierce. I mean, I imagine the young Egyptian prince hated Moses. And yet Moses ends up rejecting the treasures of Egypt and all his privileges and chooses to identify himself with the people of God. Listen to what God says to Pharaoh in verse 17. He says, for this purpose, this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Now we know God doesn't choose people because one's good and the other's bad. Moses had killed an Egyptian, you know, guard, proving that all of us are bad. God just chooses some out of the bad and makes them good. In this case, he chooses Moses and hardens Pharaoh's heart to deliver Israel from Egypt. Verse 19, you will say to me then, and some of you are thinking it right now, why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? On the contrary, who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have the right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honor, honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Now that looks pretty dismal, but here's another way to translate the last part of that verse that makes all the difference in meaning. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels who prepared themselves for destruction? Big difference. God endures all that rebellion against him. Think of the Pharaoh growing up next to Moses. How was it that Moses was saved and Pharaoh wasn't? Obviously, Moses learned about the God of his forefathers while he's there in the court. He's just a baby when he you know, left his mother, so Pharaoh was there too, hearing the same message, same teaching, but he hardened his heart against it and hated the God of Israel. He prepared himself for wrath, basically. God never judges someone who doesn't deserve to be judged. God doesn't, does everything possible, we're told in scripture, for people to believe and be saved. Second Peter 3, 9, read this with me. He's not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. That's God's ultimate desire. And here's how it happens, 1 John 2, 1. says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And here's the part I want you to hear. He is the propitiation for our sins, the satisfaction of God's justice against our breaking his laws. He bore God's wrath for our sins, and not for ours only, but also what? For the sins of the whole world. So if a man goes to hell, did he have to? No. All his sins have been paid for in full. There's no barrier between God and man except one. The only sin that can send a man to hell is that of rejecting what Christ did for him. God offers that to everyone, and yet men reject it with free choice, with free will. It's not because God blinded them and they couldn't see any, you know, couldn't do anything else. And to prove that, let's make Jesus our final authority on this. John 3, 18, he said, whoever believes in him, in me basically, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Here's the... Here's why people reject God and the forgiveness that he offers. It's not because God makes them. It's because they love their sins so much that they don't want to come to the light. They don't want a holy God cramping their lifestyle. This is what our culture is in right now. They refuse to see because they love our sins. We love our sins. The only way we ever get to the light is for the Holy Spirit to draw us. That means he's the one who breaks down our pride and our animosity toward God and brings us to believe. Even when we stumble and fall, he holds our hand, he helps us get back up. Our salvation doesn't depend on us at any point along the way. 
And you know, that is the hardest thing for us to grasp. I think that is the toughest thing for us to, to let ourselves believe and understand. I love Hugh Ross's analogy of uh, three-dimensional beings like us trying to reveal ourselves to two-dimensional stick figures. He calls them flatlanders. And if you can remember your high school geometry, a two-dimensional being would only be able to detect reality on the plane on which it's drawn, all right? So we did that. We drew two stick figures on a plane. So this is a plane, right? That's all they can perceive. That's it. The only thing they can perceive is what's on their plane. Now, think about this. What if I wanted to reveal myself to these two? I could say, I could get real close. I could go, hey, I'm here. I love you guys. Nothing. I, I mean, I could jump up and down. I could shout. I could do everything I, I, it, it possible. The only way, let me get a drink of water, hang on. The only way I could reveal myself to these two is to poke a hole through the plane. Does that make sense? Are you all following me? Or are you just going along with me? <laughs> Just going, oh, I have no idea what you're talking about now. You remember this? You remember? How many of you remember the whole idea? Okay, you got it? Got it. So a plane, that's all they can perceive. I could stick my fingers through it. Now they can perceive me, but how would they perceive me? As a circle. All they'd see is a circle. You know, and so they would, their idea is, Ron is a circle. Now, do you, do you get where I'm coming from here? Scientists say that particle accelerator experiments, those big collider things where they, they smash atoms, show that at least 10 dimensions of reality went into creating the Big Bang. They can actually see it. So, can you see why God is incomprehensible to us little 3D people down here? You know, it's why he doesn't try to explain a paradox like the Trinity other than to say we're one and we're three. Huh? It's why he doesn't bother explaining free will and election other than to say people can choose whether or not they follow me. Oh, and before time I began, I chose who would follow me. Wait, what? Exactly. But what he has revealed about himself in the pages of scripture, I mean, he's revealed all kinds of stuff about himself. It's mind-blowing. And in the age to come, when we have multi-dimensional abilities, oh my goodness, our minds are gonna be blown for eternity. If you think, well, I don't know if I'm chosen or not. Let me tell you how you know, all right? How you can know. You've been given the power to ask Jesus Christ to come in your life, into your life and take charge. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. The Bible says if you can hear his voice, this is your moment. The Bible tells us to call on the Lord while he is near, while he is drawing you to his son. And if what I'm saying is making sense to you, it's only because the Holy Spirit is opening your eyes to see it. He's giving you faith to believe in Jesus and to be born again spiritually. That's, this is a miracle moment for you. This is not a coincidence. This is not an accident that you're here today. The Apostle Paul says, receive the love he's offering you. Accept his gift of forgiveness and eternal life. This may be the only moment you get, but you're getting it. You'll be reminded of it. This is your moment. And you do that by believing that Jesus died to save you. And you will know that something has happened because your dead spirit will instantly come to life and the Bible will open up to you. Now here's the bottom line. If you believe him and you believe in him, you're chosen. <laughs> That's how you know. There's not a single person who's here today by accident. Not a single one. God set this up so you could change your eternal destiny. That's his will for you. This is a holy moment, guys. God 
is supernaturally inviting you to be a member of his eternal family. What you need to do is respond. This is not about joining a church. This is about becoming a new creation in Christ. So I want us to bow our heads together. The Holy Spirit is here in this room right now. And he's, that, that, sense, that sense in your heart, your heart's beating a little bit fast right now, that's the Holy Spirit. He's drawing you to Jesus. Respond to him. Respond to him. If you want to know that your sins are forgiven, that you're a member of Christ's family, and going to heaven when you die, this is your opportunity to get it settled. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to raise your hand and signify that you want this. Jesus said, you've got to confess me before men. So I, no one's looking around, but I am. I want you just to raise your hand and say, I want in. I want in on this. All right, man, I'm seeing hands go up all over the place. All over the place. All right. We're going to seal this right now. We get this done. Let's all stand together. I'm going to lead you in a prayer that can change your eternal destiny. And those of you who are watching this online, wherever you are, this can be your moment. This can be where you get chosen. <laughs> where you will look back forever. I mean, seriously, you will look back forever on this moment, this day. And remember, this is when you change kingdoms. This is when everything changed. So let's just close our eyes together so we can concentrate. And we're gonna say this out loud together. This is our, 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 our act of faith toward the Lord. All right, here it is. Jesus, I put my trust in what you did for me on the cross. I give up trying to fix myself and I come just as I am and surrender control of my life to you. I receive your forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. Holy Spirit, I invite you to come and fill me so I can love you so I can follow you. I confess you, Jesus, as my Lord and King. And I thank you right now for saving me. In Jesus' name, <laughs> amen. Amen, Lord, thank you right now. Thank you for a miracle of Holy Spirit transformation. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Now, here's the next step you take. You get water baptized. Jesus said, believe and be baptized. And we got a, a, a baptismal pool that's fun to get in. But it's, it's the, your way of saying, I'm identifying with Jesus now. The, the old life I used to live is gone. I'm, I'm, I'm going a new direction. We, we have baptisms all over the place, all kinds of times. So, uh, you know, we'll be, there's information in your bulletin on that. And if you did that, come down at the end of the service because our prayer team's gonna be down here and let them pray for you and let them give you something. And if you're watching this, text COMMIT to 314-310-0314 and we'd like to give you something as well. We'd like to send you something and congratulate you in, in your new walk with God. We're gonna do a little communion at the end of the service. If I forget to say that, let's, uh, I just thought this was a great, would be a great way to end this service. Uh, there's a benediction in Numbers chapter six, verse 24, and, and most of you have heard it, you know, if you went to a church, the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you. Well, someone turned it into a song. And, uh, and how many of you know the song? All right, y'all can sing out, all right? We're, Ryan's gonna lead us in this. Let's just, let's sing this to the Lord. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. And give you peace. Oh, Lord, give us peace. Touch us right now. The Lord bless you. Fill us 
with your peace right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Yeah, sing it out. It means so be it, Lord. Just now. Something was different inside you. Your heart was going, yes. Your spirit has been reborn. The Holy Spirit is now living in you. And he's witnessing that you are in indeed a child of God. That something has happened to you that's forever. Now, again, our prayer team's gonna be down here. Come down, let them pray for you. Come down, let them give you something. 
get you started in your relationship because you're in a relationship now with a living God who loves you. We're also gonna, as I said, we're gonna take communion just shortly, so God, just, oh, just pour your spirit out on us. Touch us as we go. Remind us of these words, Lord, that you're with us, that you're for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.